Hi, I don't know any of you yet, but I hope to get to know you. My name is Cleve Corner. I'm the new uh, manager of author and speaker engagement here at the Pratt. Um, and I'm really excited because we're bringing a bunch of new uh, in-person author events to the library. So it's nice to meet you all. I hope to see you again later this summer and into the fall. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff up on uh, prattlibrary.org under the Writers Live series. Uh, check it out. There might be something there for you. I'm sure there is. So Laura's going to talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then she's going to take your Q&A. Note to self, lock down the lectern next time. Um, we have audience mics here and here. So when it's time for the Q&A, if you could stand and use the microphone, it would be appreciated. Following the event, Laura will sit over here at this table. You can line up, and she's willing to sign your books as well as personalize them. I'm also very happy to have local bookseller and our bookselling partner, Atomic Books from Hamden here. Uh, they're selling books, so if you don't have a copy, please make sure to pick one up. Uh, if you're looking for an other copy, a different book, she's got 25, and I think Atomic has a bunch of uh, the different titles out there. So with that said, Laura Littman is the author of 25 books, which includes her critically acclaimed and wildly popular Tess Monahan series. Tonight, she joins us to celebrate the release of the paperback edition of her latest novel, Dream Girl. The book focuses on novelist Jerry Anderson, who is bedridden from a fall in his Baltimore penthouse apartment, you can all relate, and begins to receive, a mysteri begins to receive mysterious phone calls from someone claiming to be the title character of his best-selling book, also titled Dream Girl. Is Aubrey a figment of his imagination, or is she indeed real and coming to reclaim her story? Edgar Award-winning author Megan Abbott called Dream Girl my dream novel, the sharpest, clearest I'd take on our Me Too reckoning yet, plus enthralling. In John Warner's review of the book for the Chicago Tribune, he wrote, Laura Lippman is one of the best novelists working today, period. Seeing her name on the cover of a book is a guarantee of a highly satisfying reading experience. I confess I have not read all 25 of her published books, but I've gotten to 18 or so, and every time I've walked away a happy human. I'm a happy human because I get to introduce Baltimore's own Laura Lippman. Jim Berger, I see you. I can't come to your thing on Sunday. I'm leaving the country. <laughs> that's, that's a good excuse. <laughs> I, thought, I thought so. I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, thank y'all for coming out tonight. Um, you know, it's I've been sh pretty much shut up inside for so long, even as things have um, loosened. I was like, what was that book about? And what am I going to say about it? And what do I want to talk about? And I want to talk a little bit about where I was when I wrote Dream Girl because it was conceived in what we can now call the before times. And it was the end of 2018 when I began thinking about the fact that most horror stories or a lot of horror stories take place in remote places where people are very much alone and they don't have technology and nothing can help them reach other people, which you know I think is great and I love it. But I always thought there would be a challenge in writing what is basically kind of a horror novel in the middle of a city. And I was thinking about the fact that we're all actually a little bit more alone than we think we are. And that, you know, we get on our devices and it says we have this many friends and people are liking our stuff and we're talking to people. But what would happen if we couldn't actually reach people in real life? And what would be the consequence? And what would it be like if you could just sort of like see the city outside your window, but you couldn't get anyone to respond to you, especially if because of circumstances, you didn't have a partner, your parents were gone, you didn't have kids. Like how connected are we really? I think we live in this What's the right word? It's this kind of imagined connectedness that I don't think we're as connected as we think we are. We're always on our devices, but is someone actually always hearing us? And could we reach someone if we really needed them? And these are all the ideas that were bubbling in my head when I started to work on Dream Girl. 
I've joked, it's not actually a joke, it's very true, that if you want to figure out who inspired the cranky, um, humorless, non-PC writer Jerry Anderson, take a look at the author photo, it me. It's not, and it is, but what I didn't anticipate when I wrote Dream Girl, which I finished in the first few months of the pandemic, is that um, I might fall down one day. <laughs> For those of you who know the setup of the book, it, it involves someone in his early 60s taking a really bad fall. And to me, in 2019, that was completely just hypothetical. And I have a wonderful tennis instructor up at Bolton Hill, and he told me a story last year about going skiing with an older gentleman, someone in his 70s. And he's very fit, he's very athletic. And his second day out on the slopes, he had a bad accident. He had to be airlifted out of where they were staying. And his last words were, he's like, you know what? Whatever you do, don't fall. Like falling becomes so serious after a certain age. And I had, without realizing it, reached that age. And three weeks ago, three weeks ago, I fell down the steps in the subway in New York City. And um, I know I look, I look like I'm doing okay, right? This shoulder is so messed up. I'm going to see a physical therapist tomorrow. I don't sleep at night because there's just like kind of this all constant. And I've been given all these really cautionary warnings about frozen shoulder. Like a man I know said, oh yeah, that's really bad. I was like, what's it like? He said, I had to pay a physical therapist $200 every week for six months to make me cry. So it was like, I'm trying to avoid this. And I, I've been thinking about that hubris of believing that somehow we don't age and we're not at risk and that suddenly small things or things that used to be small. Like I watched a four-year-old on my block running along face plant on concrete, just like, boom, up, kept running. I was like, oh, I wish I were that person again. I'm not that person anymore. Um, to talk about the before times, to talk about a book conceived when being stuck at home seemed really far-fetched, <laughs> <laughs> to to think about what it's like to be cut off and to have only our devices to allow us to talk to people. It was eerie how unintentionally relevant Dream Girl became. But I need to explain a little bit about the timeline of a writer's life because I still remember most of Dream Girl. <laughs> Dream Girl was finished in the summer of 2020. Uh, since the, and then in August of 2020, I published a book of essays. And then Dream Girl came out in June of 2021. And then in January of 2022, I published a collection of short stories which had a brand new novella written during the pandemic. It's a, and it's a very much a pandemic story. Um, and then I wrote another novel that's about to come back to me to be copy edited. And I have already begun my next novel. So there's a bit of me that's kind of like, dream girl, what? <laughs> what happened in that book? What do I wanted to say? But it was very much about, um, this is a big topic for writers. And it's about plagiarism and appropriation. And this is a topic that's only gotten bigger since I wrote Dream Girl. I was actually dealing with appropriation when I published Lady in the Lake in 2019. To be a writer writing crime stories in Baltimore means that at times I have used real life stories for inspiration. So I've been borrowing other people's lives in essence, even though I'm like, oh, I'm just like using it as inspiration. And I use, use their lives to make a living. And sometimes I'm writing about people of color. 
So when I wrote Lady in the Lake in 2019, that's a very meta exercise in which it is a story about a white woman who's trying to find her way in the world professionally by researching the death of a black woman. And she is completely indifferent to anything but her own ambition and her own desire to get this story. And now, because life is just so weird, tomorrow I will go to the set of Lady in the Lake, which is being filmed in Baltimore. And spoiler alert, if you haven't read the book, which is fine, I guess I'm going to get to see Natalie Portman stabbed. <laughs> That's my understanding after I get a COVID test. So you have to, you know, very strict protocols. So I've been interested in this idea about who does the story belong to? Does the story belong to anyone? Am I guilty of appropriation when I'm inspired by a real life story? What are my responsibilities as a cis hat white woman writing about other people? I find all of this interesting. I have some peers who are just like, why are you asking me if I can write about people other than myself? I write about firefighters and I'm not a firefighter. And I find that really glib and uninteresting. I think that these questions about language and who gets to write what, I think these are important issues that we should be dealing with. Um, the best piece written about who gets to write what is written probably by the novelist Alexander Chi, also a memoirist and essayist. And if you go home to your computer and you Google Alexander Chi, C-H-E-E, -E, and New York Magazine, you will find this wonderful piece he wrote about this very naughty problem of who gets to write about whom, whose stories belong to whom. And this is like, this just keeps percolating through the culture. Um, about a, nine months ago at this time, there was a story in the New York Times that was called The Bad Art Friend. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And it was about one writer had borrowed details from another writer's life, and it turned into a lawsuit. And the most important thing you can learn from this story is the group chat can be subpoenaed. You need to know that your text can be subpoenaed. And there were these people like arguing about did, you know, was who was the bad art friend? Was it the writer who stole the story? Was it the writer who sued over her story being stolen? So I found all of this fascinating. And this anxiety about appropriation is what hangs over Dream Girl. Jerry Anderson has been accused of stealing someone's story, and he really didn't. He's so awful in so many ways. He's a terrible person. He's a horrible person, but he didn't actually steal anyone's story. He committed an act of pure imagination, and no one believes that. And I will tell you that as a novelist for a quarter of a century, this is an idea I bump up against a lot, which is no one actually believes I make anything up. They're just like, okay, who's this, who's this? And I have um, former colleagues at the Baltimore Sun who are absolutely convinced they're in my novels. And they are not. There are people who are in my novels, but they never notice. <laughs> and you know, most of all, the person who's in my novels is me. I'm writing various iterations of myself. So Jerry Anderson was me. Maddie Schwartz was me. My next novel, oh my God, I have just spent 18 months with the three most horrible people in the world. I'm so happy to see them go. Um, and it was inspired by a podcast. I was inspired by the podcast called You're Wrong About. How many people here listen to You're Wrong About? Oh my God. You're Wrong About is this wonderful podcast. It was initially done by Sarah Marshall and Michael Hobbs, and it's now just Sarah Marshall. And it basically takes a story that you think you know, and you find out you're wrong about it. And most of these stories center on women in public life who became pariahs. Sarah Marshall broke into writing by writing about Tanya Harding. Tanya Harding, not as bad as you think she is. 
<laughs> it's a very different story. And so these are, and they, they did a piece about girls who had given birth at, at proms, at dances, and what we think we know about these stories. So I've just been writing about myself all this time. And Dream Girl actually felt bizarrely personal because even though I was writing about a horrible man, who was a, he's a literary novelist. And that is meaningful because I'm a crime novelist and there is a hierarchy and there is snobbery. And I do know people in the literary world who are just like, oh, crime novels. Anyone could write a crime novel. And um, some literary people have tried and written very bad crime novels. It's much harder than it looks. But, and the writer Nick Hornby of all people once observed that it seemed to him that if you could write a novel like Dennis Lehane did with Mystic River, that was his specific example, that did everything a literary novel should do, but also did everything a crime novel should do. He said, that's like angels dancing on the head of a pin. That strikes me as better than one, one of the two. So um, it's significant that Jerry Anderson is a literary writer. It's significant that he's a snob. It's significant that he's a crotchety old man who sits in his bed and fumes about the way words are being changed and how they don't mean what they think he should mean. He's someone who, he has no patience with pronouns, all of these things. And I, I, at this point, this is where Jerry and I diverge because I actually think I'm a language person, I'm a writer. And as the language changes, why would I fight that? Why would I be like, oh. you know, there's been a, um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about transphobia and what is a woman. And there's just this amazing exchange with Senator Hawley and a professor from Berkeley about what is a woman. And I mean, in my opinion, she won that exchange. And I don't feel inconvenienced or disadvantaged by having to stop and think about how the language is changing. I think it's actually kind of a cool privilege to think about how our language is changing and how we might say something 10 years ago that we wouldn't say today. I believe it was about, time is very misty to me. I'm gonna say it was about 2014 that there was an incident that involved two trans sex workers and a customer who was killed somewhere near NSA. And the original Baltimore Sun story described them as cross-dressers. And it's just, that's just wrong. And people are like, why is it wrong? It's like, well, because that's actually something different than being a trans woman. And I like thinking about these things. I like unknotting these problems in my head and thinking about how our world is changing. And I'm just trying to keep up I mean, my guess is that there are probably things, I mean, I've been writing for 25 years, so that probably means that there are things in my earlier books that would not be appropriate anymore. And I'm actually trying to go through and find them and figure out what to do about that. Language is changing, people are changing, our ideas are changing. Is that so bad? Jerry thinks it's horrible. Jerry Anderson thinks it's terrible. Jerry wants the world to be frozen and as basically immobile as he is in his bed in the apartment building that I swear to you is not Silo Point. <laughs> That's enough. People are always like, That's Silo Point, isn't it? I was like, It's clearly not Silo Point. It has a different name. <laughs> I said, It's clearly not Silo Point. Does Silo Point have three penthouses that are duplexes on the top floor? one of which used to be owned by, you know, someone from Saudi Arabia. I'm like, no, it's not. It's like a work of imagination. Is it about more or less where Silo Point is? Yeah. Okay, fine. You got me there. But um, I just, you know, I like trying to keep up. I'm using fiction to try to maintain this conversation with the world. And 
to see how the world is changing around me because I'm changing. God, I probably shouldn't even tell this story about my kid and my kid's 12. She'd kill me if I told this story. But my kid is 12 and, and talking to her about her pronouns and how she identifies and she's just all over the place. And I think it's great. I think my kid is like, yeah, you know, I'm like, she's like, I think I'm asexual, but I might be bi. I could be a lesbian. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, just let me know when you figure it out. That'll be cool. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate her open mind and her openness to identity and to the way the world is changing. Um, Dream Girl is an extremely claustrophobic book. That was very intentional. I had just come off writing a book that literally had over 20 individual points of view in it. And I was exhausted. I was like, I just want to be in one person's head for 300 very narrow claustrophobic pages. I want to keep it still. I want to keep it here. And um, it's pretty gruesome. I won't you know, lie about that. And it, it, it goes where it goes. And I think it, it follows its own logic. As a writer, much to my publisher's distress, I never write the same book twice in a row, even if a book's been super, super successful. So I went from writing a book about 20 people to writing a book about one person. Then I wrote a book about three people. Now I'm writing a book where I just keep telling my befuddled editors, what if Miss Marple was a cougar? <laughs> yeah. What if Miss Marple was a cougar? What if you had an older woman on an adventure in Europe and bodies were falling all around her and she's just like, I'm just trying to go on my river cruise with my oldest friend. What am I going to do? Oh my God, I did not mean to be at the center of this international intrigue and all these men really seem to be into me. I don't know. Um, this is the pattern I've fallen. I'm completely self-taught as a writer and now I teach writers, which sometimes I wonder if that's really what I should be doing. But this is what I wanted to do my entire life. And I'm very much someone who, I mean, my dreams did come true. I feel really lucky and fortunate to be standing in the Pratt, which has been part of my life forever. It's the first place we went to when my family moved to Baltimore. My mom got her library degree at University of Maryland in children's literature. And I used to come down with her on Saturdays in Rome, the Pratt. Um, I probably, I'm going to tell you, like, should I tell a really embarrassing story? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so I even once took a pregnancy test in the bathroom on this floor. <laughs> <laughs> there were re I can't remember all the reasons why it was like, I need to do this here. It's like, I can't, I was living with someone and I didn't want to do it at home where he was there. Like, I'll, and like on my lunch hour, because I worked at the sun, I'll just go take my pregnancy test at the practice. It was negative. <laughs> so I feel very attached to this place. <laughs> I've lived a lot of my life here, and I've kind of just rambled on. I mean, I'm so far out from Dream Girl. I, like, I keep kind of forgetting that it's like, oh, yeah, there's this book I wrote. It's now a paperback. That's a cool thing. And I'm so unused to being out in public now. This is like just kind of overwhelming to me. Um, you know, I've been told by knowledgeable people that all of our brains have literally changed because of the past two years. Our brains are different. And I have gone from being a super, super social person to being someone who almost never leaves my house. I just don't go out that much anymore. And it's and now it's like weird. I have this big trip coming up and I'm <laughs> like part of me is like, what if I test positive for COVID right before I go on the trip? Then I get to stay home. Which is not, I know that's not good for me. So um, I'm just kind of rambling through the world now and trying to make sense of it. And the book that I wrote that will appear next year is actually very much a COVID book, but it's like early COVID. And what's bizarre about the world we live in is that now the era from the fall of 2019 to the spring of 2021, that feels historic. Doesn't that feel like a really long time ago? 
like it's completely different. And now we're in this era and this era, and maybe people would actually prefer to have their novels and their entertainment completely free of the pandemic. But I didn't know, I, I feel like I wrote an unintentional pandemic novel and then I followed up with an intentional pandemic novel. And now I'm going for sheer escapism. But with all of those rambling thoughts and stuff, I'm just gonna open it up to questions. So stand up, ask, ask AMA, ask me anything. I, only because our, people oh, like that's right. That's yeah. right. We have virtual people. Yeah. Hi, virtual people. <laughs> Can you please tell me that Tess Monahan is coming back? Because she and I are like best friends. Okay. I want her as my best friend. And so um, Tess Monahan does show up in Dream Girl. She does. She does. The next, not the next book, because the next book is... The next book is set in the, but no, Tess isn't in the next book at all. The book after that is about Mrs. Blossom, who used to work for Tess yes. Monahan. So uh -huh. we're getting closer. I haven't figured out a way to write effectively about Tess. I miss her. I, I, I kind of screwed up. I was supposed to try to write a television treatment about Tess while my daughter was at sleepaway camp, but I forgot I was going to do that. So I'm going to try to do it on this kind of vacation I'm going on. I don't know. It's really hard. Um, you know, we last saw Tess. She had a small child, and it appeared that she was about to make a second small child. Right. And I want to bring her back. She's so growing older, and as women who have followed her all along, yeah, we're getting older. Too, I know a little bit, so she should still be. Active. She ages a little more slowly than the rest of us. I will yeah. tell you that, because yeah. I've aged twenty-five years while writing about Tess Monahan, and I don't think she's aged more than ten, which is really disgusting. But fiction is fabulous. All but I want to. Are great, but Tess, I great. love Tess, she's and great. I, I just. When I gave her that kid, it really complicated stuff. Hi, thank you. Love your books. Thank you. Read them all. Walked the streets in Baltimore. Grew up here. Know it all. Um, but find out from your books, too. Um, three things. You can choose which one to answer. <laughs> You're a novelist. You can deal with stuff like that. Um, I didn't want to like him, and I kept falling into his crotchety old humor maybe because it was literary. And I, I wondered about that fine line that you walked between a guy that I really didn't want to like. He's, he's and, a, and then... He's kind of good company though, right? Like yeah. I, was, I was talking about, okay, so this wasn't about my character. I recently went to that wonderful used bookstore right over there on Charles Street. Um, what's it called? It's, it's only a year old. And it's, it's really like a block south of us on Charles Street. My daughter and I found it after going to see Hairspray at the Hippodrome. And I picked up Richard Ford's Let Me Be Frank With You. And that's about this character, Frank Bascom, that he wrote about in um, The Sports Writer, Independence Day, and Let Me Be Frank With You. And he won the Pulitzer. And I was texting with a friend. And I was like, Ugh. I was like, I, I picked up this Richard Ford book about Frank Bascom, even though I hate Frank Bascom. <laughs> and I was like, but you know who Frank Bascom is? He's like that, excuse my language, he's like that asshole that you went to college with or high school with. And every five to 10 years or so, you want to catch up with him. So I think Jerry has that vibe of he's unlikable, but he's interesting. The, and also, um, beneath his self pity and his aggrandizement, there is actually a really sad human story. Yeah. So yeah, I think it, it I mean, yeah. writing, so I teach writing and I never worry about my students' characters being unlikable. Yeah, I, I feel I like that's just a kind of a bogus thing that editors and agents say when they don't know what else to say when they're rejecting your work. Are they interesting? Are they charismatic? I think Jerry is horrible <laughs> and it's kind of fascinating how he doesn't know how horrible he is, but he's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, you can keep going. Okay. Oh, really? Bless yeah. your heart. Oh. Um, you, 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 you can jump Okay. In I'll, I'll switch off there and like. Hi, a, a couple of things. One is that 
I hope I'm not insulting you, but I saw that novel as being a literary novel. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something about my clothes. I, <laughs> no, I was, I, I was telling people I was like reading paragraphs in, you know, in a literary novel, you're like, wow, that was really neat. So well, thank I mean, you. maybe I'm like one of those people that Nick Hornby talked about who like the angel who dances. There you on are. The you're dancing pin. on pins. Thank you. Hope it doesn't hurt your feet. Um, and <laughs> Jerry Anderson, what if John Waters played him in a movie? But <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's so funny that you mentioned that because I decided to rewatch Feud, the miniseries about Betty Davis and Joan Crawford uh, making whatever happened to Baby Jane. I'm just and it's and I just before I came here, I watched the episode where John Waters gets to play William Castle, which you know William Castle was that really schlocky, gimmicky um, movie producer director, and. He, did he do it's the one where people would like actually get like an electric shock watching the movie called like the tingler or something what <laughs> waters wrote about castle he adored castle he thought he was one of the greatest like showmen of all time so yeah yeah totally but it, it i mean yeah yeah yeah, character. yeah john is jerry i'm i'm, I'm cool I'm quite good a character with that. but my question is you know in the in the introduction they mentioned that this is a me too novel i didn't see it as a me too i don't see the i didn't really grasp the connection of Me Too with, I mean, yes, he was a whatever, I mean, but he wasn't quite the Me Too's that we see. So anyway, I was curious about that. He definitely that, that has non-consensual sex in a hotel room. That's definitely, I mean, so I'm trying to be a little non-spoilers here, but okay. the okay. scene in Columbus, Ohio, it's from his POV. So from his POV, we're like, oh, this woman really wants me, this young woman. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow, and this is like a huge challenge, which is, and, and I guess maybe on some level I didn't do it because you, you and by the way, every reading, I, I want to, this is really important to me, every reading of a novel is valid. Like you don't say to someone, oh, you didn't get, it's like, so I'm like thinking about the fact that, okay, that was such a hard chapter to write because I was trying to convey that someone was having a non-consensual sexual experience, even though he didn't know it. And, and then at the end, at the end of the book, you find out, oh yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. actually but pretty That's a little gross. after the fact, but we're not going to go there. Yeah, we won't go into the full... Well, so, um, so that part... Um, I think it's more... It's not so much that Jerry is a serial... It's, it's, they're actually like little tiny details that he had sex with both his assistants or like had sex with two different assistants, but that's just what happens. Because like, right, right, you're right. seeing everything through Jerry's point of view. Jer I'll tell you this, Jerry does not think it's a Me Too novel. Mm -hmm. Jerry's very clear. He thinks he's a very ethical, responsible person and he's kind of mystified. And, you know, but then when you think about the chapters that are about him teaching at Goucher, He's pretty pervy about that one student, that, that one really beautiful student. We like, she just happens to be the best writer. And also she's gorgeous and he's mm -hmm. attracted to her. So no, I, I get that though. Well, maybe it's partly, I, I thought you did a really neat job getting into his head and writing from a man's perspective. Thank you. And um, <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Okay, you're gonna go up with another question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart. Um, and, and it's kind of tied in. I mean, one of the reasons, Jerry was, predatory, no doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt about it. That's why he doesn't want the language to change. The old language is on his side. He's still got the power. Yeah, good observation, you know? yeah. Um, but um, literary, so two things, literary and film. Um, you've got so many literary references. I loved it. Oh, it was wonderful, not only for the books, but for the films. And you could you could just kind of skate along those two and enjoy that little, you know, I got it. I know exactly what she's talking about kind of thing. Um, so that was really lovely. Um, film, who's appropriating who? I mean, if they make a film of your book, are they appropriating <laughs> your work? I and mean... <laughs> And the people who are um, working on Lady in the Lake, they're so lovely and they're so nice and they're so smart. Um, we've never met face to face. I'm going to meet the producers face to face for the first time tomorrow morning, which is really wild to me. And um, I will be meeting the director, who's also the writer, Alma Haritz, for the first time. So, you know, when I talk about appropriation, it's sort of like 
I'm stealing a real person's life or I'm stealing a life that's not mine. Um, I, I'm probably more nonchalant about adaptation on the TV film world than any other novelist I know. I'm just really, I mean, I really am like, sure. I mean, I, I would not sell to anyone. And there have been people, there were definitely people who tried to buy Lady in the Lake that I was like, I, I re, there was one producer, I won't say who he was. He really did mansplain Lady in the Lake to me. And, I, and he was like, yeah. And so Maddie ends up unhappy. And I was like, I don't think Maddie ends up unhappy. I think Maddie sees that in the world that she lives in, women make choices and she makes the choice that makes her happiest. But she's not unhappy. It's like, where did you get that? Um, so I'm just really chill about it. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm always actually a little bit surprised by how excited people get about movies and TV. And like just today, someone was like, oh my God, they're filming Lady in the Lake on my block. Congratulations, Laura. And I'm just sort of like, I mean, I got that check three months ago. <laughs> and, and you do have the, the part in the book where they talk about whether the film is better than the, the book. Yeah. So Yeah, um, yeah that's nice. like, you know, I will say, so for people who haven't read Lady in the Lake, there's a syllabus that Jerry teaches at Goucher where I did teach. And it has a list of novels and a list of films. They're not always one-on-one. -on -one. They're not necessarily watching the film and the adaptation. Like I think in one case, I'm pretty sure, I paired up um, Robert Ward's Red Baker with The Wire and you know things like that. The second and and um, Megan Abbott's, uh, oh my God, I'm so bad at titles and Megan's one of my best friends. Um, Bury Me Deep, Megan Abbott's Bury Me Deep is up against, um, oh, I said I want to live. Anyway, uh, Bury Me Deep is one of my favorite novels by Megan and Megan's one of my favorite people. So that was like, I would teach that class. I would absolutely, and, and, and also one thing about Dream Girl that I can never talk about enough, it is filled with my love and admiration for the novel Ghost Story by Peter Straub. I don't read as much horror as I should. I'm, I'm ill read in horror and I think horror is a great genre. Ghost Story, the novel is the scariest novel I've ever read. Like I, and I read it, I'm like living in Waco, Texas. I finished it at two in the morning and I have to like turn on all the lights in my apartment and just sit up all night. Like I, I cannot get, I, I love Ghost Story and it was very meaningful to me that Peter Straub who wrote Ghost Story found out through his daughter, Emma Straub, who's an amazing novelist and a bookstore owner in Brooklyn that I had kind of written this tribute to his book, which I adore. So thank you very thank much, you. sir. I agree with you about ghost story. I remember exactly the same thing, getting to the end and thinking, could this be real? Could these things really happen? And it being very scary. But what I wanted to go back to was about Jerry being an unlikable figure, but yet you find him interesting. Um, I worked as a therapist uh, for most of my career. And generally, I, you're meeting people not at their best. Um, my therapist would agree. Yeah. I, I mean, many of them are immediately sympathetic, but not all of them. Some of them come in and they, they're more like Jerry. A trick that I learned over time, and I think you used it as a writer, but maybe not consciously, is to find out about their past. In the novel, we, we see Jerry as a little boy and he's much more sympathetic there. And it helps us understand some of how he turned out to be the adult that he is. And as a therapist, that was always the trick for me. The, the patient that was difficult to like as an adult was always much more sympathetic when I could see the little girl or the little boy who'd, who'd lived through a lot of difficult stuff. Thank you. One of my favorite books of all time is um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which I actually think doesn't get quite the luster it deserves. I think it is one of the great American novels. And I think it kind of gets um, pigeonholed into being YA, a girl book, because it's about a girl. And it has this amazing lesson about empathy and writing. Franny, in the early part of the book, is sitting in a bakery waiting for the buns to go on sale. And she sees a very old man 
Um, it's early 20th century. And she's like, this is a man who is alive during the civil war. I think he has like a hole in the sole of his shoe. He's poor, he's sleeping in public. And she looks at him and she's like, he was a baby once. A mother held him and had hopes and dreams and expectations for him. And then when you realize that that's kind of, I mean, and it's true that lots of people are born in this world who aren't held by their mothers. And But still, everybody was a baby once. And when you kind of start looking through that prism, you can have empathy for almost anyone. I have a writer friend, and we've kind of gone around and around about this. I like the word empathy. He likes the word compassion. Okay, to me, it doesn't really matter. The idea is that I don't need readers to like the people that I write about. And I don't need to like them, but I actually need to have full empathy for every person I create. And to the extent, if I don't have full empathy, I feel like it's a failure. And I feel like in my earlier work, there are a couple of kind of two-dimensional villains. The title's essay in my collection, My Life as a Villainous, explains the moment in my life where I realized I had become the villainous in someone else's life, which was so like, I'm not a villainous. I'm nice. I have a reason to do what I'm doing. And it's like, yeah, but this other person thinks you're horrible. And that was like a really big moment for me as a novelist to realize that one could be both. And that most people don't walk around thinking of themselves as, as villains, except maybe on the TV show Evil, which I'm kind of obsessed with. That show is whack. You know, watching that show, that is like a crazy show. And it's like this old school CBS show, but it's all about like exorcism and the devil. And it's crazy anyway. So, but on that show, people think they're evil, but in real life, not so much. Hi, this is about the lady in the lake. I am one of uh, Shirley Parker's uh, two sons. And I was wondering, you know, I thought it would be appropriate for you to have consulted us before. I, first of all, tell me your name. Richard Price. Richard? Yes. Hi, I'm really uh, glad to meet you. And today I agree with you. Five years ago when I was writing that book, to me, it was a jumping off point. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was really writing about your mother. And certainly the character of Cleo in Lady in the Lake, to my knowledge, shares almost no history with your mother. A little bit. A little bit. I will tell you, there is one story that she definitely shares that was shared with me by someone who knew her. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who knew her as a child. And... And now I'm trying to remember the detail. He, it was interesting because we were talking about it. Um, this is something I'm wrestling with because that is part of the appropriation. And this is something I've been wrestling with since I published What the Dead Know, which was much more based on, a, like in its outlines, everyone was like, oh, that's the case from Wheaton. Everyone knew what I was talking about. Um, what I was trying to get at when I wrote Lady in the Lake, and again, I talked about it being meta. On some level, I am Maddie. Mm -hmm. And on some level, Cleo is Shirley. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to transcend that I don't know how to undo that. What I was interested in was the fact that were it not for the nature of where your mother was found, mm -hmm. this was a story that would not exist at all that it was very much about, oh, she was found here and it's the where that was interesting to people. And I went back and I, I read what was published. And one thing in the book that is true is about the discovery that there's a 
complaint that the lights are off at the tower in the lake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to me, what I was trying to get at was everybody's death matters. And there were so many deaths in Baltimore that are ignored and that the, the daily newspapers were, were completely uninterested in your mother's disappearance and didn't. That's not altogether true. The, uh, the white press didn't care, but. I, the da I said daily. I don't think the Afro was ever daily. Was it? If, no. if, if so, that's, that's the distinction I'm making. It okay. is, in talking about the daily newspapers, I'm talking about the white newspapers. Okay. The Afro absolutely covered it and was interested in it. Um, this is something I'm still struggling with. I've got a book coming out next year that's clearly inspired by real events, but real events that most people won't be able to immediately put a name to. And, and, and it's unusual in that there are multiple iterations of this thing that happens of teenage girls having babies at dances and the babies don't survive. Very mm -hmm. strange. Um, but this one was very specific. It was. And um, I feel that the only thing I can do, and it's so inadequate, is to apologize for not talking to you before I wrote and published this book. I feel that more people, people are so determined never to admit fault in our current culture. And they're so scared of the ramifications of saying I was wrong. I don't have a problem saying I was wrong. I made a mistake and I should have, and you are right. And I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk about this, but I, I know that I can't make it right. And I'm really, really sorry for any grief that I've caused you. Okay. And if you want to ever follow up with me, I'll give you my info and you can email me or call me and talk to me about it further. But I, I'm aware of the irony that even in grappling with the question of appropriating other people's stories, I caused harm and I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm really, um, I guess, happy that you've kind of delved into the appropriation and um, using of people's stories. It's kind of become this trend that's grown and gotten compounded and magnified over the years. Um, what I'm watching is that in, in context of like um, Marilyn French's book, uh, Women's Inhumanity to Women, but I see this trend where it's particularly women that are doing this because it's their only access to get ahead, which is kind of interesting. Um, but going to like mental health, the internet culture, um, before social media, we had forums, we had places where people could share experiences and talk and it was kind of like a community, but it became very unsafe because there were all of these writers who were just trolling, looking for stories to use in ways where those who most needed allies and support, um, you know, like uh, nothing was safe because everyone is, is like looking to use the story, especially the stories of those who've been used. So it kind of becomes this like really kind of fascinating mental health crisis because we're not allowed to look at who's afforded privacy um, and who's fair game to be used. I mean, I don't know of this 
aspect that you're talking about in which writers are kind of actively seeking out stories in online or public forums. I mean, if you want to look at an aspect of our culture where the use of other people's stories has become monetized, mm -hmm. that's true crime podcast. I know. And that's something that um, I actually was for a long time a fan of the so-called true crime genre. I was a fan of it back in the day when it was considered rather debased. And there was a time at the Key West Literary Festival where I did a panel, and this we're going now back to 2014. I was with Gillian Flynn, who wrote Gone Girl, and my friend Megan Abbott. And we had been invited to the literary festival to do a panel, and they're like, what do you want to talk about? And we want to talk about, we said, we want to talk about the fact that we are unironically fond of so-called lifetime movies. In our head, we were very much talking about the Betty Broderick story. You know, the first time the Betty Broderick story, Betty Broderick was a woman who murdered her husband and his new wife in San Diego and became this very polarizing figure where people are like, yay, she's a feminist. And people are like, uh, no, she's a killer. Um, she definitely wasn't a feminist, but at any rate. Um, so the first iteration of the Betty Broderick story, it's like CBS movie of the week, Meredith Baxter, Bernie. It's not prestige TV. And they actually brought it back last year with Christian Slater playing the husband and Amanda Peet playing Betty Broderick. And it's like a very different thing. So I feel that, and I, I, obviously I'm self-interested here. As a novelist, I'm often inspired by real life, but I'm not actually trying to write about the real life cases. Mm -hmm. You can see, we have to acknowledge that that is a distinction in my head that is kind of meaningless when it affects real life people. Mm -hmm. Be very clear about that. But in my head, that was the distinction I was always making, which is I'm not writing the true story. I'm writing a story inspired by the true story. So um, I don't really feel that fiction has that much to um, answer for in this case. And I, I'm, I'm not big on saying negative things about other things. So I'm not gonna name the podcast that I really, really don't like. By the way, because most of them I don't listen to. I listen to almost no true crime podcast. I don't like them, I, I don't find them interesting. I basically listen to podcasts about film. And you know, I'm a huge fan of You Must Remember This and um, You Are Good. Um, on which I've appeared, which is about looking at films through the lens of the patriarchy. So I feel that while this is a problem in our culture, I'm going to let novelists off the hook for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was more uh, just happy to have it addressed the um, people who have the blind ambition and using without. <laughs> I wasn't, so I'm happy it's, you it's a tricky, are addressing this through. It's a, a tricky thing because. Um, if I write only about stories that are mine, mm -hmm. first of all, try to like my my kid. If my kid knew that I told a story about her tonight, I'd get scalped when I went home. She would be so mad. And this is a discussion because mm -hmm. I'm on social media. And on the one hand, my kid wants to be famous, but on the other hand, she doesn't ever want me talking about her on social media. And then sometimes she'll be like oh, did you quote me on social media? I'm like, I just quoted you. I thought that was okay, but it's, it's, it's you know, super complicated. And that's why the discussion is going to keep going. But it's also, here's the thing. It's that, I mean, I, if I'm just going to write about myself, I'm out of material, you know? So it's like, okay. And most novelists, I mean, the only person who's going to be able to keep writing about himself forever is, you know, the My Struggle guy, the guy who can get like seven pages out of changing a diaper. I mean, that's a Carl, Carl, is it Carl Nosgaard? Like, sorry. <laughs> like, you know, and I think that's going to work for us as a culture. So. Are we good? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Laura, very much. Again, uh, Atomic Books is outside. You can't sign a library book, but you can buy one and get one signed here. So I just thought of that in the back, and I'm going to use that now from now on. Um, Laura's over here to sign your books, and she's able to personalize them. My colleague Sophia's over here. She'll be passing out some post-its so you can get your book personalized. Thanks again for coming. I really appreciate it.